to today's webinar, the Pre-Retirees Bucket List, offered by the Oregon State University Alumni Association in partnership with OSU's Professional and Continuing Education Unit. I'm Paula Matano. I'm the Program Manager here with, the, with PACE, and I'm joined by Yulia Dennis, who's from the Alumni Association, and Robert Poole, who's OSU Alumni Class of 67. Welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. So before we get started, I'm going to go ahead um, and share our agenda for the day. So um, I work for Professional Continuing Ed, which is a non-credit arm of the university. We partner with colleges across campus to offer open enrollment classes to the public on subjects ranging from business to beer to wood science. We're always excited to continue our partnership with Yulia Dennis from the Alumni Association. Um, I'm sure some of you have joined us for our other webinars on this career series, and so we're excited to have Yulia and Robert here today to talk about retirement. Um, PACE also partners with the Alumni Association to provide a discount on all of our classes. We love to have um, any of our beavers return to us for continuing ed. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, Robert and Yulia are going to do a presentation for us and we'll follow up with PACE courses and we'll also have our contact information and time for questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. It's been really great to work with Pace on these, these career series webinars. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. This is such a big and vital topic. Um, I really do truly love this work, and it's really exciting that we, through these career series webinars, get to help alumni, not just from job searching and, and things like salary negotiation, but also through to retirement. And we did have a survey last year where alumni responded and said, that retirement was a big important topic for them, so we gladly listened and responded. And I just want to emphasize that we I, I value hearing from you. So tell us what else you want to learn about, and we'll be glad to incorporate that into future webinars. Um, so my name is Yulia, as I mentioned before, Yulia Dennis, and I'm with the OSU Alumni Association. And I'm the director for Alumni Career Services, and a, a big part of my role is supporting alumni in their career development. So I do consultations, free resume reviews events such as this one, in-person, online. I also help people who want to volunteer and get involved. I'm very passionate about engaging in what matters and in helping others to engage in what matters to them. And I'm really glad to be here and to um, hopefully bring some value to you in your career. So uh, this session is being recorded. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar via the chat box. We're going to have questions at the end, so uh, you're welcome to type in your question whenever you think of it, and then at the end we'll facilitate the, the Q&A part. And after the presentation is done, whenever the, the recording is available, it will be emailed to you. And so you'll have this as well as the PowerPoint to reference later. And then we wanted to do a quick um, introduction disclaimer, just to emphasize that this is for educational purposes only. We're not legal. Uh, we don't have the, the legal tax or investment uh, background to give you um, advice that is beyond educational. So do contact your legal tax or investment advisors for, for specific things that, that relate to you and, and your own uh, retirement planning. And now I'm really excited to introduce uh, Robert Poole. Um, so Dr. Poole is an OSU graduate from the, the class year of 1967 in general science and pre-med. And he attended the University of Oregon Medical School, which is now OHSU, where he was magna, uh, magna cum laude and received the gold-headed cane award at graduation in 1972. He was also uh, inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honorary. And in addition to his medical practice in Corvallis, uh, Dr. Poole was a member of the Oregon Urologic Society, as well as member and past president of the Northwest Urologic Society. And locally, he serves as a board president of the Corvallis Clinic Board and Good Samaritan Hospital medical staff. And Dr. Poole has served as a trustee for a large 401k retirement plan now for 34 years. And I just want to say a really big thank you to Dr. Poole for presenting. I've greatly enjoyed working with Dr. Poole on this webinar. He's so involved. He's really caring. He has high standards. And I feel very privileged that I got to learn from him during this class as well. And, that, and, and I'm really excited that he gets that uh, we get to have him present to all of you. So really big thank you to Bob. Really appreciate your, your commitment to this topic and to helping alumni. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Poole for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Yulia. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> to start out my presentation, I'd like to give you my 10 rules for building wealth, each of which we'll delve into over the next 40 minutes or so. 
first one is start early. Use your 401k and IRAs. Don't try to beat the market. Don't chase trends. Make savings automatic. Inclusion of equities up to your risk tolerance. Keep it simple. Hold down fees. Ditch the credit card debt. And defer and lower taxes wherever possible. And before approaching this important subject, I'd like to uh, add a little humor courtesy of Ruth. I'm being serious, Carl. Have we buried enough bones for retirement? How much will you need to retire? The rule of thumb is that you will need 70% of your pre-retirement household salary if you have paid off your home mortgage. In order to get closer to that retirement number, you need to know your household fixed costs. Essentials include food, clothing, health care, housing, and transportation. Other fixed non-essential obligations include gym memberships, travel, subscri subscriptions, possibly TV and internet, although in our household we look at those as being essential. Other fixed costs on a non-monthly non basis include property taxes, insurance premiums, auto registrations, and state and local income taxes where they apply. In order to get a handle on where you are with your retirement, these are three good online calculators where you input your age, percent current salary saved, how much you have already saved, what percent of your current income will you need in retirement, and expected annual return, and with this including any pensions or Social Securities you'll be receiving. All three of these are very good, and None of them require giving personal information such as phone numbers or emails where they may bug you later. My uh, favorite one is Vanguard. I think it gives a little more information and a little easier to use. When you look at retirement savings nationally, the mean retirement savings for a family between age 56 and 61 years is about $163,000. The median for the same age group is $60,000. Only six in 10 Americans are saving enough for retirement. Unfortunately, the average Oregonian, according to OPB, this last March has saved only $12,000. So to help achieve your retirement savings, you must set your savings goals. So fund your goals before you spend. It's easy to fritter away money 95% of people put their paychecks into their checking account, spend it, and have nothing left at the end of the month. You need a plan. One of Albert Einstein's most famous quotes describes compound interest as the most powerful force in the universe. And for savvy investors, compound interest can be used to make a substantial amount of money over time. But those who are carrying heavy debt, Einstein's law of financial physics, and compounding is not good news. It works in the opposite direction. Looking at compound interest, as I'm sure most everybody is familiar, uh, comparing this with simple interest, you had $10,000 and interest compounded was at 5%. Into three years, you'd have a total amount of over $1,500. To put this in more perspective, this slide shows the power of compounding of a retirement account. This individual starts out at year one with a $45,000 a year salary and contributes 10%, or approximately $375 a month, and has assumed a 2% annual raise and a 6% return. Note at five years, the blue line, the gains are approximately one third of his contribution. By eight years, more than half of his contributions gains, and at 12 years, the gains cross over where investments are making more than the monthly contribution. By 17 years, gains are triple your contributions, and from 22 to 25 years, the investments are making greater than four times your contribution. This is the power of compounding and time. In short, the longer you wait to start saving and investing, the more you miss out on the power of compounding. 
what are the vehicles that you have available to you for investment options? On the pre-tax side, you have 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans, or you can contribute up to $18,500 a year, and those over 50 can contribute an additional 6,000. Also have traditional IRAs, where you may contribute $5,500 a year over age 50, add another $1,000 to that for 6,500. Health savings accounts with high deductible health care plans, or HSAs, allow you to contribute up to $3,400. Excuse me, I have to get rid of a little internet problem. Uh, up to uh, $3,450 for singles and up to $6,500 for family coverages. And savers over 55 can contribute an additional $1,000. This single savings benefit of an HNA, HSA is one of the <clears throat> most spectacular ones because it has a triple tax benefit. You get a deduction for federal taxes going in, the savings grow tax-free, and when you withdraw and use the money for qualified health care expenses, there's no taxes. The average couple who's retired will spend approximately $280,000 during their retirement on health care expenses with premiums and non-covered expenses. If you look at the post-tax investment options, you have the Roth IRA with limits of $5,500 and over age 50, another $1,000 can be added. You have the Roth 401ks, where you can add $18,500, and as of this year, over the age of 50, you can increase that to $24,500. These are subject to required mandatory distributions but if you roll over your Roth 401k into a Roth IRA, you will avoid these required mandatory distributions, which is a big deal. The Oregon Saves Plan started last November because millions of Oregonians didn't have investment plans at their work. And these operate just like a Roth IRA, except the contributions are limited up to 10% of their income annually. This program was rolled out in November for employers with employees of 100, with 100 or more employees and will continue to roll out in waves finishing up in 2020. 529 plans, for those of you that have children or grandchildren, are a great investment vehicle for college educations and such. There is no federal income tax on the earnings. Looking at employer investment plans, even if your employer has a pretty lousy uh, 401k plan, maybe the expenses are too high or the investment options aren't very good, sign up for enough to at least get any matching funds. Frequently, employers will match up to 50% of your contributions up to a certain percentage of your salary, like 2 to 3%. And I don't know of any immediate 50% return you're gonna get on your money in any other type of opportunity. Also, strongly consider diversifying your retirement portfolio from an income tax standpoint by contributing at least a portion to a Roth IRA, if you have, excuse me, Roth 401k, if you have it available, particularly when you're younger and your salary is lower, as well as your tax bracket. It's really impossible to know where you're gonna be with the tax brackets when you retire. So that diversification is important to consider. In talking about investment savings, what can't you control? You can't control the market, you can't control the interest rates, and you can't control inflation. What you can control are personal and investment expenses, diversification, and allocation. One of my recent favorite Warren Buffett quotes, investors handicapped by debt miss extraordinary opportunities. If you look at the average credit card debt in the state of Oregon, 
$800 or so. Current interest rates on unpaid balances is about 16 to 20 percent, and if you're in default, can be as high as 27 to 30 percent. So try to avoid using a credit card for paying by for paying for unexpected expenses by building up an emergency fund with enough cash to pay for routine bills and emergencies for approximately six months, so you don't have to get into using your credit card. In looking at credit card expense spending habits, you can see that at the top is spending more than one can afford on unnecessary purchases. This may be include a brand new car, which may have an average loan lasting approximately six years, which runs about $500 a month for a depreciating asset. Not a good investment. Next quote is, performance comes, performance goes, fees never falter. In looking at investment expenses, this is an example of a portfolio of $100,000 over 20 years with a modest 4% annual return. Note the blue line represents a quarter percent ratio, the red line a half percent expense ratio, and the green line 1%. The difference between the quarter percent and one half percent expense ratio over 20 years is $10,000, and the difference between the quarter percent and the one percent is $30,000. Expenses matter. In looking at a larger retirement account, the $280,000 difference between a quarter percent and quarter and one and a quarter percent expense ratio is staggering and it can go a long ways to providing a comfortable retirement. Looking at asset allocation, this is a strategy, strategy that aims to risk, balance risk and reward by apportioning a portfolio's assets according to an individual's goals, their risk tolerance, and their investment horizon. You can see from this slide that approximately 91% of the portfolio's movement over time are explained by asset allocation and only about 9% due to market timing and individual security selection. It's time in the market and not market timing. Are you on the right glide path? As you get closer to your actual retirement date, you must make sure that you have the proper allocation of your assets into equities, bonds, and cash. This frequently means reining in your expectations and risks and decreasing the equity portion of your portfolio to around 40 to 60 percent while bringing up the bond and cash portion of your nest egg to, as you approach retirement. To quote economist Benjamin Graham, the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. Many investors have behavioral biases such as overconfidence and confirmation bias and loss aversion that leads them astray when making financial decisions. Many financial advisors may recommend they use the glide path, which can help overcome these issues. Looking at a glide path, if you look at the left-hand side, you'll see that the uh, purple and light blue, these represent domestic and international equities and represent about 90% of your portfolio starting out at age 25. You have the turquoise, which represents the international bonds, and the blue, which represents domestic bonds. As you move to the right, as you're looking as you get close to 60 years old, you'll notice that the amount of domestic and international equities is decreasing considerably, and the amount of your domestic and international bonds increases, and you begin adding short-term inflation-protected securities. This is one of my favorite charts, and for those of you that remember basic chemistry, it looks like a periodic table, and it has to do with diversification. These colored boxes represent different investment styles. It is impossible to consistently predict when any particular style is going to be up or down. 
look at the emerging markets, which is the red wine colored uh, boxes. They have returns all over the map. Some of them right at the very top, and then the year following 2007, they were at the very bottom. Trying to pick an individual investment style and time the market when you can choose from a balance fund, which represents the gray boxes in this area, and those are in the middle, the upper portion of the slides. Yes, the gray boxes in a balanced fund are not at the very top, but they're not anywhere close to the bottom either. So this is something to consider when, when you're investing. Now looking at a performance of a $10,000 investment between January 1996 and December 31st, 2015, you'll see if during that period of time you were fully invested, you would earn a rate of approximately 8%. If you miss just 10 days, your return would be cut almost in half. And if you miss the 20 best days, you'd be down to approximately 2%. And by missing a month, you're already into negative returns. Again, it's time in the market, not market timing. Following your gut reaction is dangerous. And many investors selling on major downturns then become afraid to get back into the market and miss the upswing. Most investments are created by <clears throat> time and not brilliance. Remember to rebalance. A 60%, 40% bond portfolio in March 2009 at the end of the bear market crash would be 83% stock and 17% bond portfolio at the end of 2017 and possibly way out of sync with your appropriate glide path for your age. If you don't think you've saved enough for retirement, uh, <clears throat> consider working longer or phasing in retirement. Working part-time through retirement can be a comfortable way to transition to other interests in life and also add a little extra pocket money. By delaying retirement just one year, you have the potential to increase your annual retirement by 9%. Set up a cash position. This is really important. Establish a cash pool that will rough Will, will cover two to five years worth of your routine expenses. Take your regular distributions from this pool and periodically fill it up by reallocating your earnings from your bond and equity holdings to keep you in correct balance and to a money market or short-term short treasury account. When you need to begin taking required mandatory distributions or RMDs from your retirement accounts at age 70 and a half, you can also use these funds to replenish your cash pool. Setting up this cash pool is particularly important for new retirees because if the market takes a major downturn just after you retire, you don't want to be selling your equities at a fire sale prices. Uh, and it will be really hard to ever recover your nest egg, particularly if it happens at the beginning of your retirement. <laughs> Having money set aside <clears throat> The un, for the unexpected. It's not pessimistic, it's prudent. Looking at the sequence of withdrawals for retirement, it's not uncommon for retirees to have many different streams of income like Social Security, pensions, retirement accounts, and taxable accounts. As a general rule, make withdrawals from your taxable accounts first so that your retirement accounts continue to grow and compound tax-free. If you have a year with unexpected incomes, then it may be beneficial to take withdrawals from a Roth 401k or IRA that hopefully you've been able to establish along the way. Since such withdrawals won't increase your adjusted gross income and push you into another tax bracket. This can be beneficial if you have your routine expenses and then say want to purchase a new car and by taking money out of uh, a non-Roth product you're going to expense your, you know, push up your adjusted gross income and your tax bracket. Whereas if you have a Roth IRA, you can take that money out, use it, and it doesn't affect your taxes. Looking at Social Security, full retirement age for those born in 1956 is age 66 and four months. You can take Social Security at age 62, but if you wait for 
for full retirement age, you'll receive a third more in monthly repayments, or in monthly payments. If you wait to age 70, you'll continue to gain approximately 8% a year. If you continue working and take Social Security before your full retirement age, you'll lose a dollar for every $2 you make over approximately $1,400. Currently, an average 65-year-old can expect to live 20 to 25 more years. Approximately 41% of 65-year-old women can expect to live to age 90 and 20% to live to age 95. Men, approximately 28% will live uh, 65 years old, lift age 90, and only 10% to age 95. If you are still working and you're in good health, consider delaying taking Social Security payments and let your assets grow at approximately 8% a year until age 70. I know of no other investment, investment with a guaranteed rate like that. If you are married and you don't need the extra Social Security income, consider having the higher lifelong earner delay taking Social Security so that the assets, assets can continue to grow at the 8% approximately until age 70. Then when the first spouse dies, most frequently us males, the other spouse may collect the higher of the two Social Security payments, often again the males. This extra income can play an important part in lieu of long-term care insurance, which we'll discuss in a little bit. So again, if you take your Social Security early at age 62, you'll get 75% of the benefit. But if you wait until age 70, you'll get 132% of the benefit. However, if you are in poor health or have health factors that mitigate possibly not being able to live into your 70s and 80s, this may not work. But in taking the uh, benefit at age 70, the catch-up, so how much you would have missed out by taking uh, Social Security earlier, it catches up to about age 84. At age 84 and above, uh, and above, that's when you begin to really get the benefit of that. A little discussed Social Security benefit is the spousal benefit. An example of this would be if Social Security is needed, have one spouse start taking Social Security at the full retirement age, and the other spouse let their benefit grow at 8% till age 70. When the spouse who is not taking Social Security benefit reaches at least age 62, he or she may apply for half of their spouse's Social Security benefit, all the while letting his or her benefit grow until age 70, when he or she can start taking their own benefit. The rule of thumb for withdrawal strategies is a retiree can take approximately 3 to 4% of a portfolio's value per year adjusted for inflation. This is based on withdrawals required to last approximately 30 years and has a confidence level of 85%. The above has a good chance of holding true if withdrawals are decreased during bear markets. Currently, only approximately 1.5% of the population survives to age 95. In looking at those individuals who are retiring before they're Medicare eligible, you may use your company's COBRA insurance that provides insurance for approximately 18 months. But beyond that, you'll need to look at short-term insurance rates. And in Oregon, as of February of this year, it costs between four to $17,000 for short-term insurance, depending upon deductibles and co-pays, co-insurance, and of course, your health status. HSAs with a high deductible health care plan are a good alternative or supplement when dealing with this. Looking at long-term health care expenses, you can see that homemaker expenses in 2017 is the last data that I could get. That's approximately $55,000 for adult daycare, $23,000 for assisted living, approximately $49,000. And if you're in a nursing home, 
in a semi-private room, approximately $105,000 a year, and for a private room, approximately $111,000. And note that the five-year annual growth rate for in nursing homes and healthcare, home healthcare is approximately four to five percent. Looking into long-term care insurance, currently long-term care insurance for a couple aged 55 costs, depending upon your current health status, a low of $2,000 to approximately $9,500 a year. In addition, rates have been going up approximately 10% or more a year. You can check into inflation protection and consider lifetime benefits, but at least get two to three years worth of benefits since that's the average time patients would be spending in nursing homes. You stop paying and you lose all your benefits and all your contributions. One way to prevent or delay needed expensive medical and long-term care expenses is to take advantage of the benefits of regular physical exercise. This activity can extend your years of active and independent life, reduce your disability, and improve your quality of life. How do you maintain quality of life? Keep moving, you never stop. Comparing physical activity to exercise, physical activities are lifestyles and activities that get your body moving, gardening, walking, raking leaves, taking the elevator, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, versus exercise is a particular form of activity that is specifically planned, structured, and repetitive. Kinds of activities that improve health and physical ability. These include endurance, strength, balance, and flexibility. This is a recent study came out in January of this year from Southwestern Medical Center which showed that exercise can reverse damage to sedentary and aging hearts and help prevent future heart failure. To reap the benefit, the exercise should begin by late middle age or for sure before age 65, while the heart still retains some plasticity and ability to heal itself. You must perform the exercise four to five times a week in 30 minute sessions, plus your warm up and cool down time. Those that completed this two year study showed an 18% increase in maximum oxygen up uptake and a 25% increase in the compliance or elasticity of the heart's left ventricle. Looking into estate planning, at the very least, have a will or living trust so that you and not the state will decide your, where your assets are going to be distributed after your death. But a trust can also give you control while your life kicks in when you die, has continuity since you can appoint yourself as a trustee and also have co-trustees if you are disabled or no longer want to handle the trust, and convenience with the assets not subject to expensive and time-consuming probate. Also, make sure that all your beneficiaries are up to date. Again, going back over my personal 10 rules for wealth building are starting early, use your 401k and your IRAs, particularly getting into the Roths, don't try to beat the market, don't chase trends, make savings automatic, inclusion of equities up to your risk tolerance, keep it simple, hold down the fees, ditch the credit card debt, and again, defer and lower taxes whenever possible. If you need ongoing financial advice and guidance on retirement matters, consult a registered investment advisor who represents you in a fiduciary capacity. These are a couple of links that you might find uh, helpful. First one has been around for a while from PBS, and it goes into the importance of controlling expenses. And the second one is a good one for any individuals who have an income that exceeds the limit for funding a Roth IRA. There's this backdoor method which is now accepted and this tutorial goes into that. Okay, that's it from, from me. Thank you so much, that was really great and helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Poole, for that very informative presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Yeah, no, it's a cookie um, cookie things I should do. <laughs> yeah, I'm eager to get started on my own retirement planning. Um, 
So definitely I'm looking forward to the Q&A portion of this event and seeing what kind of questions the, the audience and all of you have for Dr. Poole. And I do want to give a, a reminder before we, we do the Q&A that today from 1 to 1.30, we're doing our online career connections event. And you can still register for that. So you'll see, um, you'll see it up on the screen there. And it's, um, it's going to be an online event where you're going to be partnered with the, with the participants who attend. And it's going to be a chat, a one-on-one -on -one chat based event. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Dr. Poole will also be there. Um, so looking forward to that after the event. And then if you have questions, you can always reach out and follow up with me. Um, feel free to email me if you want any kind of assistance with your, with your career development. Any if you're doing, I will do questions very soon okay. here. Yeah. So, we'll, um, so reach out to me anytime, and I'm definitely happy, happy to help you out. Um, I'm not a retirement expert, but I, can, I would be glad to help you with any kind of goal setting or planning for your career and things like that. So. Um, I will now turn it over to Paula for some additional information on PACE. Great. Thank you, guys. Sorry about the slight mix-up with the slides. Um, so thank you so much, Julian. Thank you so much, Dr. Poole. I found that very helpful. Um, the more I learn about retirement, the more I realize it's never too early to start planning. I wish I could go back to my 18-year-old self and say that. Um, I did want to give some information to our audience. I talked a little bit about professional and continuing education. Um, here at OSU and the reason that we like to partner with the Alumni Association and hear from our alumni is oftentimes we're able to connect with the very widespread OSU network that's throughout not only the state of Oregon but the United States and even beyond that to be able to offer educational opportunities for personal enrichment and professional development. So we offer classes on uh, financial management. We have a class that's coming up actually on June 25th called Negotiation Strategies. We which teaches essentials of negotiation for you as an individual. Um, we have classes on, you know, tasting wine, which is, I think, one of our more popular ones rather than um, financial strength, but that's okay. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know as well that OSU alumni receive 15% off of any of our PACE courses, so we're always excited to see our alumni come back uh, for continuing education. And so I think that we can just jump right into the questions if that works for you guys. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. So, yeah, one second. Let me just... Um, sounds good. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and read these out, and then Dr. Poole is going to give us an answer. So, we have Mike, who is wondering, how do I know if my company 401k is a Roth that can be rolled over to a Roth IRA, or can all 401ks be rolled over to a Roth IRA? That's a good question, Mike. The... Uh, standard for years and years has been the regular 401k and many plans now are adding the Roth so your your uh, human resource person or whoever is managing your retirement plans would be able to tell you if you have an actual Roth 401k and again it's a great way to diversify obviously with your 401k regular one you put those in um, uh, pre-tax and your Roth 401k would have to go in post-tax. But again, by diversifying that, uh, you're never going to owe any taxes on the, all the investment earnings. And the younger you are, the sooner you should start out with that. Uh, but uh, if your uh, retirement plan does not have a Roth 401k, then I would talk to them about establishing one. Thank you. So Ben was wondering, do you recommend deferred compensation? Um, I have to know a little bit more about what the deferred compensation would be in this case. Um, yeah, um, Ben, I'm not sure if you want to uh, jump in with anything else as well. It looks like he had one more question, too, is how does one avoid capital gains tax when selling a home and downsizing? <laughs> that's, a, that's a real tough one. Um, you know, one of the ways you could avoid that is if you, uh, instead of selling the home, you turned it into a rental home and, uh, you know, managed it that way. But um, there is a deduction uh, for couples. I think it's up to $500 or $500,000 that over that you don't have to pay capital gains. And if it's an older home that you purchased and then remodeled, be sure and save all of your receipts for uh 
expenses that you've done so that when you sell the home, you can add that to the value and, and it'll increase. You bought a home for 250 and you put $100,000 in it, uh, and it'd be 350. So you would probably not have any capital gains with your marital deduction if you're married anyway. That's good to know. We yeah. just remodeled our house. Yeah, that's really good mm -hmm. to know. Thank you for, sure. Thank Thank you for that question, Ben. Yeah. So what are strategies for dealing with health care costs? It seems like you can save your whole life and have it wiped out. With an yeah, cost. that is a, a, a really good question and a significant one. Like I mentioned that, uh, you know, the average expense for a retired couple is about $280,000, and that's just including your Medicare premiums and your, your uh supplemental insurance that you usually get along to go with that and any uh, not paid. Um, you obviously, like we talked about, uh, try and stay as healthy as possible with your exercise and that, that type of thing. And um, the insurance um, market is changing daily. And um, you can look at Again, trying to control um, out-of-pocket things, but I think that the, the most thing that I could say is using the HSA, because you can put money uh, into the HNA, HSA up to the limits I talked about, and that money will grow as an investment, and you can use that um, uh, at any time. You can, 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 as long as you have a job, you can continue putting that uh, money into an HSA at the limits per year. And again, those check the HSA program. There's some that the companies that uh, have high expenses and things like that, but um, there are, are good ones. There's probably two or three good ones that have low expense ratios. And you can put that money in, let it save for years and have really uh, several thousand or several hundred thousand dollars, if you're particularly younger, saved up at that time because you really can't predict uh, what's going to happen? It may be an accident. It may be, you know, a long-term health issue that you didn't know you were going to get. So it's just saving enough so you won't get crippled by those types of expenses. And of course, well, as of uh, yesterday's uh, newspaper or whatever, they're saying that Medicare is uh, going bankrupt in in eight years. So uh, who knows what's going to happen? So it's going to be even more important for you to to uh, to address that issue. And I think HSAs are the best way to do that. Thank you very much. So can you contribute to an HSA even, oh, I lost the question, hold on. All right, guys. Um, a lot of the HSA make you use the money within the same use Make, within the same year. So are there ones that you can put into and save for the future? Is there a set oh, yeah, you HSA get, account? You can okay. get an HSA uh, account. You have to have a record keeper that does that. And then they're linked to, like Vanguard is linked to several HSA. So you can put your money into investments. You don't have to, uh, it's not like, it's not something you have to use every year. What do you, uh, has been around for a while where you, you're your employer, you can use put away such and such, and then you have to use it at the end of the year. An HSA, you can yeah. put it in and invest forever. Okay, so the, I think there's a difference between the flexible spending yeah, account flexible and the health spending account. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm a few years uh, No, no, that, that sounds but, good. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a flexible spending account where you have to use it. HSA, you put it in and let it let it uh, ride and, and, and gain, and that's your best insurance. Sure. So, so Bob, would you recommend for those who are on the, you know, that are, quite far away from retirement, would you recommend they just start now putting money into I think the sooner you start with an HSA, you don't have to fund it to the max. You can fund it to whatever you can. And again, the important thing with an HSA is to read about them and get the record keeper with a low expense ratio and uh, use a good uh, investment provider like Vanguard. And there's at least one or two that use the Vanguard funds and some Fidelity or even Schwab. And that have low expenses, but make sure the record keeper has low expenses so you're not having to fight that for the whole time. But that, that's a, a wonderful thing to, to have available for you. Yeah, Great. and you did teach us just now that fees matter. So yeah. that's a great point. <laughs> and um, just one more question on the um, HSA. So can you contribute to an HSA even if you don't have a high deductible health care policy? No, that okay. is required as okay. in the slide. You have to have a high deductible health care. And 
you know, for most individuals, and particularly as you start building your HSA, if you have something, you know, the high deductible, it may be, I don't maybe one, five or $6,000, and that's a lot of money, but particularly if you're putting it away, you may have that already established in your HSA. But yes, uh, that's an important point. As on the slide, it has to be associated with a high deductible health care plan. Great, thank you very and much. There's good ones of those out there too. <clears throat> Um, we had somebody who was wondering if you could go over the social, and we have several questions, if you could go over the Social Security spousal benefits one more time. Um, how do those benefits continue or increase when the primary passes? And okay, um, I can use my own uh, as an example. Um, <clears throat> I happen to be in, in uh, good health, and so, um, and being the longer, um, higher earner, I went ahead and did not take any Social Security at uh, either early or at my 60, at age 65 at that point, and I let it grow because, again, I don't know anything that's a guaranteed 8% until you reach 70. And then when my wife reached her full retirement age at 65, then I was able to, uh, the same phone call, she uh, called up the Social Security and and uh, got hers arranged on the phone, and then she handed me the phone, and I said, uh, I'd like to begin uh, taking half of hers. So I, we were able to get her full Social Security, she started at full retirement age, and then let mine continue to grow at 8%, and I was having the benefit of getting half of hers. And so um, that's the spousal uh, benefit I'm talking about. Great, thank you. Um, if the primary doesn't start collecting does the spouse have to wait until 65 to get that half benefit, or can they start collecting? You want to. You, you have to. Uh, you want to wait till full retirement age. Okay. Uh, before you know the half, the, the spouse is going to take that. Great, thank you. Um, we have some questions that are specific about Oregon State employees, and so I think we might want to do a little bit of research offline, and we can address those questions when we send out the recording, just so that we can point everybody who's the faculty or staff here at Oregon State um, in the right direction as well. So I just wanna let you guys know we will be addressing that. Um, and so, let me just... Um, if there's no other questions, I'll add something. Yeah, so um, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Uh, one yeah. of the things, I wasn't sure how much time I'd uh, have to get through what I did get through and haven't talked about annuities and, um, Annuities can be very expensive. They can have high sales uh, costs associated with them. And they also, if you take them out early, past five or six years or before that time, you have expenses on the, on the time you take them out early. And if you're an individual that is really concerned and can't sleep at night, worried about the market, and I appreciate those concerns, uh, what you could do is take out 15 or 20 5% of your investment pie and put that into an immediate fixed annuity where the costs are much lower and then you can sleep at night. The one problem with that is you have a fixed amount of investments and if you have some type of major emergency that comes along, that money that you put into an emergent, into an annuity is locked up. You're gonna get your benefits until you, know, uh, you die or whatever, one immediate annuity, you, put in $100,000 and you get those benefits until you pass on. So um, again, I'm not a fan of them except in that relationship because of the expenses. You can also look at life insurance and whole life and those are very expensive ways to uh, you know, look at insurance. I think the decreasing term uh, for those of you that uh, are um, still working and have family and need to have that when you get into retirement, if you're nest egg is growing and you don't really need to have uh, the life insurance and um, uh, so that's yeah. another reason for starting early and getting that uh, investment high growing so you can avoid other expenses. That's, yeah, that's really great information. Thank yeah, you. good advice. Well, um, I think we've covered uh, most of our questions and again, we'll, oh, we have one more. So uh, following up on the Social Security, if her, their wife didn't have full Social Security earnings. Can she still take half of his Social Security at age 66? And then he defers until 70 to gain the 8% you talked about? Yes. She, if, if, uh, 
if if you're if the young lady is 60 mm -hmm. is, is retirement age, and her husband is already taking his Social Security, she may take half of his and let hers grow to you know eight percent until she retires. Okay. Perfect. So yes, may do that. And um, again, there's a lot of other ways to uh, you can use CDs or another low expense ratio where you ladder in CDs uh, or certificates of deposit or right now the interest rates have been so low that I've only done that for six or months or a year but you can ladder those in and that's another very safe way of having um, uh, CDs available but uh, they'll, the rates will be getting better since unfortunately we're starting to have some inflation and um, any other questions? I think that's um, all of our questions for today. Thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you to Dr. Poole for that uh, really informative and helpful presentation. I know that I've had a lot of questions about retirement that I just pretend aren't there and ignore, and so this is really helpful for me. And well, um, as Julia said, this has been recorded. We're going to go ahead and send out the recording with the uh, PowerPoint presentation. You'll have access to all of the links that were available throughout here, as well as the cited um, sources, so you can look up some of that information for yourself as well. Um, and again, thank you all so much, and uh, yeah, go thank be. You, everybody. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Yeah, this is really great. Thank you.